In this module, we will consider collision problems. While the collision of two particles is the archetype of a collision problem, the approach can be applied in a broader context. An alternative example would be an object exploding into several smaller pieces. What all collision problems have in common is that they ignore the details of the forces that occur during a brief period of interaction and use conservation of momentum along with energy arguments to relate the motion of objects before their interaction to their motion after the brief interaction. All collision problems conserve momentum. However, energy is a little bit more complicated. It is assumed that a collision occurs over such a short amount of time that the displacement of the objects is negligible during that interval of time. This means that there is no change in the potential energy of the system. So what this means is the change in the total kinetic energy of the system will be related to the work done by non-conservative forces. The types of collision problems fall into two basic categories. First, if the total kinetic energy is conserved, then we have what is called an elastic collision. On the other hand, if the total kinetic energy is not conserved, we have something called an inelastic collision. And inelastic collisions can be broken down further. First, we have something called perfectly inelastic collisions. In this case, the colliding objects lose energy to deformation and stick together so that there is a single final object moving with a single velocity. All other kinds of inelastic collisions need additional information about the work done by non-conservative forces in order to be able to solve them. To understand this more clearly, let's consider some examples. Consider first the case of a perfectly inelastic collision between two particles. Before the collision, we're going to assume that mass 1 is moving to the right with some velocity, and to guarantee that there is a collision, we're going to have mass 2 moving to the left with some velocity. We can write the total initial momentum of the system as the momentum of particle 1 plus the momentum of particle 2. Because the particle mass 1 is moving to the right, its velocity will be a positive number, and because we've assumed that the mass 2 is moving to the left, its velocity will be a negative number. On the other hand, we can also write the total initial momentum in terms of the magnitudes of the velocities of the two particles and explicitly put the signs into the equation. This is fine to do as long as we know the quantities which are going into the calculation. If they are known quantities, then we can use their magnitudes and put the signs explicitly into the equation. After the collision, the two particles have stuck together. It has a total mass of m1 plus m2, and it's moving with some final velocity. But we don't know the direction of that final velocity. So we're very careful when we are using velocity that's an unknown quantity to use it without considering its sign and putting the sign explicitly into the calculation because we don't know for sure what that sign is. We allow the sign of the answer to determine what the direction of the final motion is. So using conservation of momentum, we can say that the initial total momentum is equal to the final total momentum. And this gives us an equation that we can use to solve for the final velocity. Clearly, if the momentum of mass 2 is larger than the momentum of mass 1, since the momentum of mass 2 is moving to the left and has an, a negative sign associated with it, and it's larger than the positive momentum moving to the right, the final velocity would be negative in that case. We would get a negative number for v sub f, and this would indicate that the particles were moving to the left after the collision. Now let's consider a slightly more complicated example. This example is called perfectly inelastic momentum exchange. What we have in this example is two people on skateboards initially at rest, and one of the people is carrying a ball and is going to throw it to the other person. So, if the person throwing the ball recoils with a speed, v sub 1, equal to 2 meters per second to the left, what is the horizontal velocity of the ball relative to the ground while the ball is in the air? Of course, after the ball is caught, the ball and the other person are going to be traveling along with some common velocity that we'll call v2. What is the velocity v2 of the person catching the ball after the ball is caught? Well, initially, of course, the total momentum of the system is zero because both people and the ball are at rest. Now, we consider the case where the ball is now in mid-flight. The person has thrown the ball and is moving to the left with velocity 1. The ball is moving to the right with velocity v3. 
And the final total momentum of the system can be written as minus m1 times the magnitude of the recoil velocity v1 plus the mass of the ball m3 times its speed v3. And we can also consider that we are adding in the momentum associated with mass 2, which is 0. From conservation of momentum, we have that 0 is equal to our minus m1 magnitude v1 plus m3 v3, which we can solve quite easily to find the speed v3, which is 20 meters per second. Now, after the person catches the ball, the ball and the person are going to recoil with some velocity v2. We can write the total momentum of the final system as, again, minus m1 times the magnitude of the recoil velocity v1 plus the total mass m2 plus m3 moving to the right with speed v2. Conservation of momentum gives us that 0 is equal to minus m1 magnitude of v1 plus m2 plus m3 times v2. We can solve this easily for the speed v2, which turns out to be 1 and 1 third meters per second. Notice that we did not need to use any energy arguments in order to determine the final velocities of the person and the ball, or even the intermediate velocity of the ball as it was traveling through the air. On the other hand, we can use energy arguments to determine how much work was done throwing and catching the ball. For example, when the ball was thrown, we know that the change in the kinetic energy between when the ball was still being held and when it was thrown is going to be equal to the work done by the person holding the ball and then throwing it. So that work done is the change in kinetic energy, which is going to be 1 half m1 times the magnitude of v1 squared plus 1 half m3 v3 squared minus 0, which is the kinetic energy of the system initially. If we calculate the numbers, we find that the work done by the person throwing the ball is 1,100 joules. Now, when the person catches the ball, the speeds change again and energy has changed in the system. The person catching the ball has done some work. Just how much work is done catching the ball? Well, again, we look at the change in the kinetic energy, which is going to be the work done by the non-conservative forces. That change in kinetic energy, well, we still have the mass 1 moving with 1 half m1 v1 squared. And now we have the pair of masses m2, m3 moving with speed v2. So we had to add to this 1 half m1 plus m2 v2 squared. And we want to consider only the work done by the person catching the ball. So we want to subtract from this the work done by the person throwing the ball. When we do this, we find that the work done catching the ball is actually minus 933 and one-third joules. The person catching the ball actually absorbs energy into their system in the process of catching the ball. Now consider the case of an elastic collision between two particles. Before the collision, the total initial momentum is m1 v1 initial plus m2 v2 initial. After the collision, we write the total final momentum as m1 v1 final plus m2 v2 final. Each particle has its own initial and final velocities. Each number could be positive or negative. We're just simply assuming that at some point during the process of their motion, the two particles do collide with each other. So conservation of momentum tells us that the initial total momentum is equal to the final total momentum. And we have an equation which has two unknowns in it, v1 final and v2 final. This is not enough information to solve for either one. We need more information. So we turn now to the kinetic energy. This is an elastic collision. So we calculate the total initial kinetic energy, which is 1 half m1 v1 i squared plus 1 half m2 v2 i squared. We do the same for the total final kinetic energy. And we see from conservation of kinetic energy that we have a second equation, which relates v1 final and v2 final. So now we have two equations and two unknowns. And now it's possible to solve for the solution to this pair of equations. However, this is not the easiest system of equations to solve because the equation for kinetic energy involves the unknown velocities as quadratic terms. They're squared. To solve this, what we're going to do is take the first equation for conservation of momentum and rewrite it by collecting the terms multiplying m1 on the left and those involving m2 on the right. And then we're going to take the kinetic energy term, multiply by a factor of 2 to get rid of the 1 halves, and then rearrange it again so that our terms involving m1 are on the left and m2 are on the right. Now, 
we can use the fact that the difference of the square of two numbers can be written as the difference of the numbers times the sum of the numbers in both the left and the right hand side. And if you look carefully and you notice that the M1 term multiplying the first, the difference of the numbers is of exactly the same form as the term in the conservation of momentum equation, we see that we can cancel these terms on the left and on the right. And we wind up with a term just involving the velocities. And we can rewrite this in a form which gives us the relative velocities of the particle before the collision and the relative velocity of the particles after the collision. And these turn out to be the negative of each other. So we can now rewrite our pair of equations as, first of all, we still have the conservation of momentum equation, but we can replace the conservation of kinetic energy equation by this equation for the relative velocity difference. Using these two equations, it's now much easier to solve for V1F and V2F because these are linear equations. The easiest way to solve these is to take the equations. And now, since we want to find, first of all, V1 final, what we want to do is multiply the energy equation by minus M2. Now, we can add the two equations together. The V2F terms cancel out. And we have, as a result, an equation which can easily be solved for V1 final. To get V2 final, we do the same sort of thing, except this time we multiply the energy equation by positive M1. Now we can add the two equations together, and we get an equation which can easily be solved for V2 final. For one-dimensional collision problems, if you know the initial conditions, M1, M2, V1, V2, then you can always figure out the final velocities. For the case of perfectly inelastic collisions, you have one equation and one unknown. In the case of an elastic collision, you have two equations and two unknowns. In both cases, we can always solve for the unknowns. For two-dimensional collision problems, if you know the initial conditions, then you cannot always figure out the final velocities without additional information. For perfectly inelastic collisions, you have two equations and two unknowns. The two unknowns, of course, are the components of the final velocity. It's now in two dimensions, so there are two components to the final velocity. You are still only using conservation of momentum, but it's a vector equation, so that one equation of conservation of momentum has two pieces to it, two independent equations. For the case of an elastic collision, you wind up with three equations and four unknowns. This cannot be solved without additional information. The four unknowns, of course, are coming from the two final velocities, each with two independent components. And while the momentum equation turns into two equations, the conservation of kinetic energy equation is only a scalar equation. There is only one equation there, even in two dimensions. So to solve an elastic collision problem in 2D, we need some additional information about the final velocities. Consider 2D perfectly inelastic collision. We again solve this by using conservation momentum. We use conservation momentum in the x and the y directions separately. So we find the initial momentum in the x direction and set it equal to the final momentum in the x direction. And we have the initial momentum in the y direction equal to the final momentum in the y direction. And these can be written out in terms of either the components of the initial and final velocities, or for the initial velocities where we know the uh, magnitudes and directions, we can write these in terms of their magnitudes and the cosines of the angles. But remember, it's always going to be easier to solve for the unknowns as components instead of trying to find directly the magnitudes and directions of unknowns. Once you know the components of the unknowns, you can then convert these into magnitudes and directions if you need to.